Uh, anyway, we're going to talk about Cain, Abel, and the priest. It's a question that often comes up, and uh, people want to know the answer. And we're going to talk about, as we begin this, we'll talk about these three sons and what's going on. The three sons in Scripture are the sons of men, the sons of God, and the sons of perdition. And there's a difference. Those are the three sons that always show up in Scripture. Who are the sons of God? Who are the sons of men? And who are the sons of perdition? The sons of God are always defined as those who know who know the gospel, those who know and understand the gospel. The sons of men are those who don't. And the sons of perdition are those who do know and receive that power, are made aware of that power, and are partakers of the power of God, and then altogether turneth therefrom and shall not receive forgiveness of sins in this world or the world to come. Those are the sons of perdition. So these are the three sons spoken of in Scripture. Um, the sons of God, and Noah and his sons hearkened unto the Lord and gave heed, and they were called the sons of God. Once you hearken and give heed, you're called the sons of God. But verily, verily, I say unto you that as many receive uh, me, to them I will give power to become the sons of God, as it says in DNC 11, and also the same in John chapter 1. Even to them that believe on my name, they become the sons of God. That's the definition of the sons of God, those who know and understand the gospel. Um, DNC 25, hearken to the voice of the Lord your God while I speak unto you, Emma Smith, my daughter, for verily I say unto you all those who receive my gospel are the sons and daughters in my kingdom. I'm Christ, it says in DNC 35. The Son of God who was crucified for the sins of the world, even as many as will believe on my name, that they may become the sons of God. Again, those who believe, even, uh, even one in me as I am one in the Father, and the Father is one in me that we may be one. So that's the Coming back, how do we become a son and daughter of God? Uh, is for that uh, is believing in Christ. Now the sons of men, knowing his sons, hearkened unto the Lord and gave heed, and they were called the sons of God. And when these men began to multiply on the face of the earth, the daughters were born unto them. The sons of men, now these are those who don't know or don't accept the gospel. The sons of men saw that those daughters were fair, and they took them as wives, even as they chose. And the Lord said unto Noah, The daughters of thy sons have sold themselves. Behold, mine anger is kindled against the sons of men, for they will not hearken unto my voice. So that gives us a definition of who the sons of God are in relationship to who the sons of men are. Um, in Moses chapter 5, we read, Wherefore Lamech was despised and cast out, and came not among the sons of men, lest he should die. Now Lamech was cast out, he becomes master mayhem. And he couldn't even go out among those that didn't believe because they might kill him because he had revealed the secret of the secret oaths and combinations. And the works of darkness began to prevail among all the sons of men, and God cursed the earth with a sore curse and was angry with the wicked and with all the sons of men whom he had made. And they would not hearken to his voice nor believe on his only begotten son. So there's another definition of the sons of, of men and who they are. Well, the son of perdition what you have to do and know to become a son of perdition. We learn in the Doctrine and Covenants in section 76, and this is the best place for it. It says, And thus saith the Lord concerning all those who know my power and have been made partakers thereof. So you have become a son of God. You now know his power and been made partakers thereof. And many explain this as those who have received their calling election. Thus saith the Lord concerning all those who know my power and have been made partakers thereof and suffered themselves through the power of the devil to be overcome and deny the truth and de defy my power. And they are they who are the sons of perdition, whom I have said it had been better for them never to have been born. Those are the sons of perdition. Those who have accepted the gospel, received the power of God, been made partakers of that power, and then altogether turneth therefrom, as it says in section 84, shall not receive forgiveness of sins in this world or the world to come. Uh, 76 goes on, concerning whom I have said that there is no forgiveness in this world or the world to come, having denied the Holy Spirit after having received it, having denied the only begotten Son of the Father, having crucified themselves and put into open shame. These are they who will go away, away into the lake of fire and brimstone with the devil and his angels, on the only ones on, on who the second death shall have any power. Yea, verily, the only ones who shall not be redeemed in the due time of the Lord after the suffering and death. So there, there comes a point where everyone but the sons of perdition, no matter what kingdom you're in, you're going to be totally happy and satisfied. I mean, we don't like to say that because we like to think people going to the celestial kingdom are going to be in pain forever, but it doesn't say that. The Doctrine and Covenants tells us that I never said, that, and this is the Lord speaking, he says, I never said there wouldn't be an end to this suffering or an end to this pain. He just says, I called it endless and eternal because that's my name, but I never said there wouldn't be an end. In the Alma chapter 40, verses... 14 and 22, might be 15, 21, 
it's against my religion to memorize scripture, so I can only get, <laughs> you know, almost only works with atom bombs and horseshoes, so, so I just want to get close. But um, it says there that those in paradise and those in prison, the pain in prison and the happiness in paradise will last until the day of redemption, till the resurrection, only until. Eh? And uh, that's, we would think, well, if you can remember, you're going to be in pain for eternity. But Isaiah says in chapter 65, he says, after that resurrection, he says, this life will not be remembered nor come into mind. Isn't that great? That's a great thought to me. That's a wonderful thing. This life will not be remembered or come into mind because it will be over. I don't need to know what I did when I was two years old. Go ahead. You mentioned about calling an election being made sure. What was that in reference to? In order to become a son of perdition, you'd have to, it says, you, who know my power and been made partakers thereof. But I thought having a calling an election sure made you would be in this, meant you would be in this You would, unless you sin against the Holy Ghost. And that's what it's talking about. Unless, unless there's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, going on in verse 43, who glorifies the Father and saves the world of his hands, except those sons of perdition who deny the Son after the Father has revealed him, who uh, to reign with the devil and his angels in eternity, where the worm dieth not. That means these are those who will not forget what they could have had. The worm dieth not. They will always remember and suffer for what they have done. That's the sons of perdition. But everyone else who's not a son of perdition, it is. Everybody else will be totally happy and satisfied where they're at. You know, heaven is where you belong and hell is where you don't belong. And that's what Mormon says there in, I think it's chapter 9 of Mormon, about verses 4 through 6 there. Um, it says that you would be more miserable to dwell with a just God with a bright recollection of your guilt. You would be more miserable to dwell with a just God than you would with the damned souls in hell. Which means that Hell, heaven, can be in the celestial kingdom. Hell would be in the celestial kingdom if you're not worthy to be there. Hell is where you don't belong. Heaven is where you do. And that's what, that's what Mormon's trying to teach there. So anyway, the worm dieth not for the sons of perdition. They will not receive that time when they don't know what they have done or be in a time. Well, Cain was told that he could, he could become perdition. And when the Lord comes to Cain, he says, if you don't change your ways, you can be perdition. And that tells you a lot about how far the, Cain had accepted the gospel. Well, going with Cain. He is the firstborn in the gospel. Remember, I tried to explain that he's the first one born after they get the gospel. He's the first one in the gospel, and he should be the patriarch. He should become the patriarch to Adam. But there's certain things that the patriarch has to do, and Cain didn't fit that, that standard. And Adam and Eve blessed the name of God, and they made all things known unto their sons and daughters. Satan came among them, saying, Don't believe it. I'm also a son of God, and they believed it not, and, Satan, and they loved Satan more than God. And then Cain is born. She conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man-child from the Lord, wherefore he will not reject his words, hoping that he's now going to be worthy to become the patriarch, uh, so that that can go on. Cain holding the priesthood in the in in the position to become the first patriarch was not righteous in his priesthood activity and priesthood responsibility of serving others. Who is the Lord that I should know him? The first, pur the first purpose of the priesthood is to serve other people. And his question was, am I my brother's keeper? So he, and even though he held the priesthood and offered sacrifice, and Joseph Smith tells us that Cain and Abel held the priesthood, and they probably had received that calling election because the endowment was real. They were washed and anointed to be, not to become anciently. We do that in our day, but anciently that was not the case. You proved yourself true and faithful. And then he rejected God, even after having received it, and says, who is the Lord that I should know him? Am I my brother's keeper? Which is not congruent with becoming the patriarch, which is responsible for the spiritual and temporal welfare of all his father's posterity to be his brother's keeper. And so he has not that character to do, do that, especially when he says, am I my brother's keeper? 
And Abel, he brought the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel's offering. But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect, and Satan knew this, and it pleased Satan. And Cain was wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art, art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? So they are both functioning in the priesthood. In their right, Cain should be the patriarch. But his priesthood activity is not such that makes the that it makes him unworthy to be that patriarch. And Cain and the Lord is giving him a chance. Why are you worrying about it? What are you? What's going on? What? what you, why? And the Lord knows what's going on, but He's giving him a chance to make that choice. The Lord speaks to Cain about the priesthood covenants He had made and says, "If thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted; and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door." So it's what He's saying: If you're true and faithful to the covenants you made. It's going to be good. It's going to be well with you. But if you don't, Satan desires to have thee. You'll be delivered over unto, unto the buffetings of Satan. And that's what he's telling Cain. If thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And Satan desires to have thee. And except thou shalt be heart, hearken unto my commandments, I will deliver thee up, and it shall be unto thee according to Satan's desire. But thou shalt rule over him, because you have a body as it, as it goes on. If you're not true to the covenants you have made, you will be in Satan's power. And it shall be said in time to come, the Lord continues, that these abominations were had from Cain, for he rejected the greater counsel which was had from God, and this is a cursing which I will put upon thee, except thou repent. So the Lord's giving Cain a chance to change his character. But he doesn't. Now Satan speaks to Cain about the benefits of following him and introduces secret oaths and combinations based on Cain's endowment of power he received from his father. This is one of the reasons you know that had Cain had received that endowment of power. One is, is that he's offering sacrifices. And, sa and the gospel, Satan already, Joseph Smith said, Satan sets up his kingdom at the very same time that the Lord sets up his. As soon as Adam introduces the gospel of Jesus Christ, Satan is there saying, I am also a son of God. As soon as the endowment of covenants, uh, oath and covenants is introduced to Cain and Abel, then Satan is there introducing secret oaths and combinations at the very same time and you do it at the same time that it's set up and with somebody who has that background and that's what Satan that's what Satan's doing you remember if you've got any questions ask and Satan said unto Cain swear unto me by thy throat and if thou tell it thou shalt die and swear thy brethren by their heads and by the living God that they tell it not for if they tell it they shall surely die and this that thy father may not know it and this day I'll deliver thy brother Abel in thy hands and Satan swear unto Cain that he would do according to his commands, and all these things were done in secret. So you have oaths and covenants, and then you have secret oaths and combination. An oath is always a symbol or form of death or sacrifice. That's, that's what oath means in Hebrew. That's what it always means, to cut a covenant. And an oath is always a symbol of death, and that's what he's saying. Swear unto me by thy throat, and swear, or swear, and swear thy brethren by their heads that they tell it not. That... It, we make a covenant. A righteous covenant is between an individual and God. When we go to the temple, it's as though nobody else is there but us and God. We do it collectively for the sake of time. But when we participate in the temple covenants, it's as though there's nobody else there. We are making a covenant with God. A combination. And an oath is a similar form of death or sacrifice. A combination, an oath and combination, is this symbol of death. Swear unto me by thy throat, and thy brethren by their heads, that they tell it not. A combination is making a covenant, an oath covenant, between me and a group of people. An oath and covenant is between me and God. An oath and combination is between me and a group of people. That, okay, we're going to keep, we're going to do this, and I'm going to be secret about this, and if I don't do it, then you, any of you, have the right to kill me. That's a combination. An oath and a covenant is sacred. It's, I would rather die then break the covenant I make. Not that you can kill me, but this is so sacred to me. This oath and covenant is so sacred to me. I'd rather I'd rather die before I break this covenant. I'll I'd rather do that. I'd rather die before the covenant. I break the covenant. Where an oath and combination is, you can kill me if I don't keep the secret. You see the difference? There's a difference there. So anyway. So secret oaths and combinations are set up by Cain patterned after oaths and covenant. And we see the same thing in the Book of Mormon in Ether. Akish gathered to the house of Jared all his in kinfolk and said, Will you swear unto me that you'll be faithful in anything which I desire? And they all swear unto him. See, that's the combination. It's with, between people. Um, 
uh, they swear to him by the God of heaven and by the heavens and also by the earth and by their heads that whoso should vary from the assistance which Achish desired should lose his head and whoso should divulge whatsoever thing Achish had made known unto them, the same should lose his life. And it came to pass they did agree with Achish and Achish did administer unto them the oaths which were given of them of old also sought power and who also sought power which had been handed down even from Cain who was a murderer from the beginning. So we see these oaths and combinations being set up there. An oath is always a similar form of death. It's a symbol of sacrifice or death. Now we have, as kids have participated in oaths for a long time. Even as children, children even today still participate in these, this oath formulary. If you remember when somebody says, well, hey, did you hear this, what so-and-so did? And you say, well, no, I didn't. Tell me what it did. And he says, well, it's a secret. And then the person says, tell me, I cross my heart and hope to die. You remember that? You, we all did that. That comes from this. That is the old oath formulary. It's not crossing your heart of Catholicism or, or, or the crucifix. It's the dividing asunder. It's the cutting in two. Cross my heart and hope to die if I don't keep the secret. That's where that comes from. And Cain went in the field. Cain talked with Abel, ends up killing him. And Cain gloried in that which he had done, saying, I am free. Surely the flocks of my brother fall into ham. He's free from his priesthood leader. Remember, Abel's sacrifice is chosen. Abel now becomes the patriarch. Cain should have been the patriarch, but his priesthood act activity was not, his priesthood character was not such. So Abel's sacrifice is offered. Abel becomes his patriarch. The younger son, which always is a problem with siblings, the younger son becomes the patriarch, and Cain says, and Cain kills him and says, now I am free from my priesthood leader, my brother, my younger brother. And everything he has is now mine, he believes. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries to me from the ground. Now, the blood in the Targums, which is the oldest Old Testament uh, uh, manuscripts in the Targums, blood is in the dual. You have singular, uh, dual, and plural in Hebrew. And blood is in the dual, which means it's not talking about blood liquid blood, it's talking about bloods which are genetic, it's, are, it's talking about descendants, thy brother's descendants are crying from the ground. That's what it means. Now remember Joseph Smith said all of those patriarchs and prophets that have a responsibility on earth, they were set apart in the councils of heaven and that's what it's saying here. The descendants of Abel are crying from the ground because of what they have been set apart to do. Okay? That's what that means in the Targums. And then he tells Cain, Thou shalt be cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive her, thy brother's blood from thy hand. Targum says, The voice of thy brother's blood in the duel cries from the ground. This means the voice of thy brother's descendants cry from the ground. Those who have been foreordained to be the patriarchal line of Abel. He was chosen to be the patriarch, and that line was chosen in the councils of heaven. Descendants of Abel were set apart as the patriarchs in the council of heaven. Joseph Smith said, Every man who has a calling to minister to the habits of the world was ordained to that very purpose of the grand council of heaven before this world was. I suppose I was ordained to this very office in that grand, grand council also. Well, Cain's livelihood, remember, was a tiller of the ground. And a tiller of the ground has a specific lifestyle. And that lifestyle is sedentary because he just, he has to stay there because you have to plant, you have to weed, you have to harvest, you have to prepare the ground. So. The livelihood as a farmer is a tiller, being a tiller of the ground. That's the livelihood and, uh, which creates a lifestyle, and that lifestyle is sedentary. The livelihood is tiller of the ground, and the Lord says, When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield thee her strength. So his livelihood is going to change, and his lifestyle is sedentary. And the Lord says, A fugitive and a vagabond, thou shalt be in all the earth. So his livelihood and his lifestyle is now going to be completely different than it was before because of what he had done in killing his priesthood leader and that's really the issue. So far as the priesthood goes he should have been the birthright son but he lost that right by murdering his priesthood leader who was Abel. And God, and we read in the uh, book of Abraham that he was cursed pertaining to the priesthood, Pharaoh being of that lineage, or Cain's lineage, by which he could not have the right of the priesthood. And those are, that's a quote from uh, the book of Abraham. Cursed are all those, this is in DNC 121, which comes back in connection with what Cain did. Cursed are all those that shall lift up the heel against mine anointed, i.e. Abel. 
or others, or Joseph Smith, saith the Lord, they are the servants of sin and are the children of disobedience themselves. Woe unto them because they have offended my little ones. They shall be severed from the ordinances of mine house. They shall not have the right to the priesthood nor their posterity after them from generation to generation. That's what it says in DNC 121, that if you murder the priesthood leaders, you and your posterity can be cut off from the rights of the priesthood and the temple from generation upon generation. There in DNC 121. Cain murdered his priesthood leader Abel, believing that he and his posterity would now have the birthright authority to rule over mankind for the rest of world history. And that's why he says that the Mahan principle is to murder and get gain. The gain in this, con in this context would be that patriarchal right to rule over all humanity, all of Adam's posterity, from the beginning of time to the end of time. And that's what he lost. Abel now murdered. A new patriarch is needed as the other children of Adam and Eve have rejected the gospel. Remember, they all rejected it. Abel's the, Abel's the one that didn't. Cain rejected it. Abel didn't. And then the others. And now that Abel's there, they need another patriarch because Cain is unworthy. And so we read in Moses 6, And Adam knew his wife again. She bare a son and called his name Seth. And Adam gloried in the name of God, for he said, God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And that's what Seth means, is replacement. That's what Seth means, is replacement. And God revealed himself to Seth, and he and rebelled not, uh, not, but offered an acceptable sacrifice like unto his brother Abel. And unto him was born a son, and he called his name Enos. So Seth becomes the new patriarch, and that's why the patriarchal line always goes Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalil, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shem, Arphaxad, right on down. Um, so Seth becomes the substitute for Abel, and that's what his name means. He becomes the substitute for Abel, and that's what Adam says. God is appointed to be another seed instead or as a substitute of Abel who Cain slew. This is connected to the Leverite law. Cain says, once, this, once the, curse, or the, the burden takes place, Cain says, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the land. From thy face I shall be hid. This is the context of the, of, the, of the priesthood here. From thy face I shall be hid, because the priesthood is required in order to be in the presence of God. We learn in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it shall come to pass that he that findeth me will slay me because of mine iniquities. For these things are not hid from the Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Whosoever slayeth thee, vengeance shall be upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. The mark was not, a part, was not the curse. The mark was a blessing to Cain. Whatever that mark is, we don't know what it is at this particular time. Whatever that mark is, that mark was a blessing to Cain because it was to keep him alive, to keep him and his posterity alive, whatever that mark was. And we don't know what the mark was. We know what happens later on in time to that descent, but to that lineage, but we don't know what that mark is because the scriptures are silent on that. So God placed a mark upon, upon Cain to save him, and that's what it's, this is telling us, to save Cain. And the Lord set the mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Whatever the mark is, it was not part of the curse or burden, but given by God to protect and preserve Cain from the wrath of others. We learn in the book of Abraham, and it says there in, in chapter 1, Now the king of Egypt was a descendant from the loins of Ham and was a partaker of the blood of the Canaanites by birth. From his, this descent sprang all the Egyptians, and the blood, thus the blood of the Canaanites was preserved in the land. When this woman discovered the land, it was underwater, who afterwards settled her sons in it, and thus from Ham sprang that race which preserved the, case, the curse in the land. So through Ham's lineage, he married Egyptus, who was a descendant of Cain, and, and everything is... Um, um, uh, everything was a matrilineal patriarchy, and so beca because everything is traced back through the mother's line, mitochondrial line, uh, and even and the patriarchal priesthood is traced back through the mitochondrial line, uh, because Ham, and Ham was righteous and held the priesthood, we learned that in Moses, uh, Noah and his three sons walked with God, they held the priesthood and walked with God, but Ham married Egyptus, who was a descendant of Cain, therefore being, being a matrilineal concept, all of Cain's descendants were curse pertaining to that pre curse pertaining to the priesthood as Abraham is saying because it's coming because it's matrilineal not from Ham not because Ham was unrighteous or wicked okay any questions so far <coughs> simple minded or easily persuaded <laughs> yeah clear as mud now the first governor of Egypt was established by Pharaoh the eldest son of Egyptus the daughter of Ham and it was after the manner 
of the government of Ham, which was patriarchal. Pharaoh, being a righteous man, established his kingdom and judges people wisely and justly all his days, seeking earnestly to imitate the order established by the fathers in the, in the generations of the days of the first patriarchal reign, even the reign of Adam, and also know his father, who blessed him with the blessings of the earth and the blessings of wisdom, but cursed him pertaining to the priesthood. So that's that lineage that comes through, through Ham's line. There's two cradles of civilization that we, we know of, that, or what we call the two cradles of civilization in the world. One is Egypt and the other is Mesopotamia. Both are established by the grandsons of Ham because they couldn't hold a priest. And what they did is they took the endowment of power and turned it into a coronation ceremony. Thus, Egypt and Babylon become the symbols of wickedness in Scripture and the two cradles of civilization because they turned that endowment of power into the ancient coronation ceremony. If we had time to go through it, we'd show you that. Because the descendants of Cain were not identified, the policy was instituted by implication. For behold, the Lord shall curse the land with much heat, and the barrenness thereof shall go forth forever. And there was a blackness that came upon on all the people of, Ch of Canaan. And Enoch also beheld the residue of the people, which were the sons of Adam. And they were a mixture of all the seed of Adam, save the seed, of, the seed of Cain. And the seed of Cain were black and had not place among them. And that's why that policy was created. Because not all black-skinned people in humanity are the descendants of Cain. But because we don't know who they were, there was an implied policy in order to protect the doctrine. Does everybody understand that? Any questions on that? It's not, had he been something different, it might be, di it might be something else. The church has recently stated that the restriction of priesthood to the blacks was a policy rather than a doctrine, and this is true. The doctrine, however, is that the seed of Cain could not have the right of the priesthood, and a belief that the seed of Cain were black, based on scriptural references, led to a general restric restrictive policy to maintain the doctrine, not knowing who might or might not be a descendant of Cain. What would be the safe policy if all we knew about the descendants of Cain was they had red hair, blue eyes, and freckles? The policy would be completely different if that's all we knew about the descendants of Cain. So the policy was instituted in order to protect the doctrine. Well, it's a doctrine that the descendants of Cain were restricted. It's a policy that blacks be restricted. Joseph Smith ordained Elijah able to the priesthood. However, there was no initial question to initiate the revelation. After the ordination, Joseph translated the book of Abraham and received the revelation that, and this is what Joseph Smith said in, multiple, in more than one place, said that the seed of Cain would not hold the priesthood until the seed of Abel had a chance to come to the earth and fulfill their responsibility. That's a statement by Joseph Smith. And many of the early brethren, and many even in our time, in our lifetime, said, well, Cain, well uh, Abel never had any posterity, so they'd never be able to hold the priesthood in this life. But that's not what Joseph Smith said. Joseph Smith, all he said is the descendants of Abel, or Cain, would not hold the priesthood until the descendants of Abel had an opportunity to fulfill their responsibility. And many of those uh, brethren that said these, uh, that some of those things did not know and understand that the doctrine of the Leverite law. What was it that the seed of Cain lost? <coughs> to be a minister to all the people. as it said, to, Speaking of what the responsibilities of the priesthood, to minister to you, to be your servants, that they shall bear this ministry and priesthood to all nations. They just lost an authorized responsibility to administer to all those who would like to participate in the gospel. That's what they lost. The right to administrate, not the right to participate. Okay, there's a big difference. The priesthood is for administration, not for participation. The seed of Cain was restricted from the administration of the gospel, not from the participation in the gospel. There are many cultures and peoples that have a dark skin who are not the descendants of Cain. There is no rank in the kingdom, only responsibility. Priesthood is a responsibility of service and not a requirement for salvation. And we see this, especially in Exodus, when, when the uh, children of Levi are chosen. When Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. And the sons of Levi gathered themselves together, and him Moses and Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And the blessing was, being the tribe of Levi, bringing the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron the priest, that they may minister un unto him and do the service of the tabernacle. That meant that all of Israel was restricted from holding the priesthood. Before all of Israel had it, until this time, all of Israel was able to hold the priesthood for administration. But when this event took place in the Old Testament, the priesthood is now given only to the tribe of Levi. 
and all the rest of Israel were restricted against the priesthood. So this restriction has taken place often. It's administration, not participation. All of Israel could participate at the temple by bringing their sacrifices and keeping the law of Moses. They just couldn't administrate. Am I making sense? I'm, there's no questions. You never know if anybody's catching what I'm trying to say. And that's what's going on here. We learn it here uh, too, that they shall wait on the priest's office. And he says, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all of the firstborn. Anciently, every firstborn was to be, was to hold the priesthood, no matter what tribe. The firstborn was to hold the priesthood. That was the administration. So the Lord says, okay, I'm going to take that away from all of the tribes of Israel. Now only Levi, only that, that lineage, only the sons of Levi are going to be able to hold that priesthood. Okay, that's the way it works in Scripture. Well, the patriarch Abel. Every sealed man becomes a patriarch to his family. There are grand patriarchs who must hold the Melchizedek priesthood authority and their responsibility for the spiritual and temporal welfare of those who, outside of direct family lines. When you're sealed, you enter into the patriarchal priesthood. And every man and woman enters into that patriarchal priesthood. Uh, in the celestial kingdom are three levels of degrees. In order to obtain the highest degree, a man must enter into that order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. That's the patriarchal priesthood. And Joseph Smith said there are three priesthoods, Aaronic, Melchizedek, and Patriarchal. We enter that patriarchal priesthood, and every, and every man and, and wife is a patriarch and matriarch to their immediate family. And you can, by being sealed, I have the authority to bless my children or grandchildren by virtue of the authority of the patriarchal priesthood, which I hold because I've been sealed. I can do that. But the second I step outside of my family line, I can't do that. I have to have a priesthood without father or mother. I have to have the priesthood of the firstborn who's responsible for the temporal and spiritual welfare of all his father's posterity, and that is Melchizedek authority. So I can even, I could bless my children by virtue of the patriarchal authority, which I hold, but I, if I go to my neighbors or home, te home teaching families or ministering families, I have to have another authority, and that's the Melchizedek authority. Now, that Melchizedek authority, anciently, you had a patriarch, and then there would be another patriarch. That patriarch was responsible for the temporal and spiritual welfare of all his father's posterity. He's a patriarch in the patriarchal priesthood to his direct family line, but he has to hold the Melchizedek priesthood if he's going to be responsible for the temporal and spiritual welfare of all his father's posterity. Does that make sense? Okay, that's important to understand. The grand patriarchs must hold the, the Melchizedek priesthood to function outside of their father, outside of their family line. That's why in the scriptures it talks about that the, that the priesthood is responsible for the fatherless, the widows, and the orphans. What's the common element there? There's no patriarch. The Melchizedek priesthood, the Melchizedek authority is to be a stand-in for a missing or unworthy patriarch. This is why women will not hold the Melchizedek priesthood. They are a matriarch in the patriarchal priesthood. They hold the patriarchal priesthood if they've been sealed with their husbands. But the Melchizedek priesthood is a substitute for a missing or unworthy patriarch to make sure that they get all the blessings and are taken care of temporally and spiritually. I hope that makes a little sense anyway. The patriarch is a prophet, priest, and king to his family, a prophet to give inspired guidance, a priest to provide the necessary ordinance of salvation and exaltation, and a king to provide the temporal protection and prosperity. And that's the way that division was anciently, a prophet, priest, and king, so a patriarch becomes a prophet, priest, and king to his family. And if you hold the Melchizedek authority, then you can be that priest and provide those blessings for those who have a missing patriarch. The patriarch is a prophet, priest, and king. The birthright son is not only responsible for his own family, but by virtue of the patriarchal priesthood, by virtue of the patriarchal priesthood that he holds, but is responsible for the spiritual and temporal welfare of his father's posterity, which requires the authority of the firstborn to be responsible for those outside the immediate family. A different authority is need Melchizedek authority, which is the authority of Christ, the firstborn and birthright son of the father, with an inherent authority for the spiritual and temporal welfare of all his father's creation. Go ahead. So in the last class you were talking about they left, Adam joined Eve because you cleave unto your wife, you join her family, and now all of a sudden we're seeing it all. Because like in Israelite tradition, they <coughs> the woman joins the man's family, and they're responsible if she doesn't have a child, you know, that can marry the brother and then the brother. 
Right, and, that, and that's the Leverite law because because she she has to receive a birthright. Her her firstborn son, the or the firstborn that open the firstborn son that opens the womb, has the right to the birthright uh, uh, blessings or the inheritance, a double a portion of the inheritance of his father's family. But it's the matriarch who chooses. It still comes back to the matriarch. The matriarch has that responsibility because only she knows who her birthright son, who 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 her firstborn son is, and who the father is. And that's why even today you can become Jewish, but you have to be Jewish through your mother's line or your grandmother's line, not your father's line. But the patriarch is responsible for providing and protecting that matriarch and her children, providing a firstborn for her. For her. That's why Rebecca says, of what value will be my life? If he if he marry if Jacob marries the daughters of Heth, her her purpose will have been have failed if they can't hold that priesthood, hold that patriarchal priesthood. Anyway, the firstborn and right, the grand patriarch is the birthright son who should be the also should also be the firstborn son. There's a difference between birthright and firstborn. However, the birthright goes to the first righteousborn son who may not be the firstborn. Reuben was the firstborn son, and you can't get away from that. But Joseph, even though he's number 11, is the birthright son. Okay? And Joseph is the birthright son because the, the order goes from the firstborn of the first wife to the firstborn of the second wife. It's the one that opens the matrix. The one that opens the womb. And so it doesn't go to the secondborn of the first wife. It goes to the firstborn of the second wife, and then to the firstborn of the third wife. And then concubinical children only begin counting after all of the natural children are gone. Does that make sense? Okay, Adam is the first man, the father of the race, the father of all mankind. Adam is the first father and the patriarch of humanity being the first man. Adam is the firstling of humanity, but not necessarily the firstborn or the birthright son. You have, the, you have, you have different sacrifices in Israel. One is the firstling of the flock, and one is the firstborn. Adam is the firstling of the flock. Christ is the firstborn. And Christ is the birthright. So that's why the sacrifice of redemption. So you have Adam. Then you have Cain. Then you have Abel. And then you have Seth. And then you have Bubba. And then you have Billy Bob. <laughs> or at least we don't know who they are, but we only have three names there. But Cain's offering is rejected. Abel's offering is accepted. And Abel is chosen to be the patriarchal leader and patriarch for all of Adam's posterity. So he's responsible to make... Make sure that Billy and Bubba Bob's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren all have the gospel opportunities and everything that they need. The younger is often chosen to be the priesthood leader and the patriarch. This is a real problem. It sets a pattern. We see it with Michael and Lucifer. As we, we learn in the scriptures that, Adam, uh, that, uh, uh, that Satan was before Adam in section 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And that's the argument that we see going on in scripture. We have Cain and or Abel and Cain. We have Seth and Japheth. We have Isaac and Ishmael. We have Jacob and Esau. We have Joseph and Reuben. We have Ephraim and Manasseh. And we have Moses and Aaron. And we even have Nephi and Laman. We often see that the younger son, because the birthright goes to the first righteous born son. The first, you can't change the firstborn. But the birthright, those responsible in that patriarchal authority, goes to the first righteous born son. And that's why we see this pattern of the younger being chosen over the elder. So we have Adam and then again we go down then Abel is chosen to be the new patriarch under him. Abel becomes the grand patriarch responsible for all his posterity. And so Cain ends up killing Abel. And Cain, Abel is then responsible. He's the priesthood leader of Cain and, and Seth and Bubba and Billy Bob. For this reason the priesthood is traced back through Abel and his posterity. But because Abel had no kids, there's an issue. Cain murdered his priesthood leader, hoping that he and his posterity would become the patriarchal leadership, the kings throughout the world's temporal existence. And we learned this in the section 121 that we just talked about. They shall not have the right of the priesthood nor the posterity after them from generation to generation. With the murder of Abel, the patriarchal leadership moves to the next righteous born son. But Seth, God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, who Cain slew. That becomes Seth. Well, there's the grand patriarchs, Adam, Seth, slash Abel, because Seth is the replacement for Abel, Enos, which means Enos, under the Leverite law, Enos would have been Seth's son who married Abel's widow, and he's actually sealed to Abel. That's the Leverite law. 
if a first if if a wife if a woman marries the firstborn and he dies before she has a son she is to marry the brother and the firstborn son that she has is sealed to her and her first husband and is the lineage of the husband this is the Leverite law in the Old Testament so that's why the slash between Abel and Seth so Enos even though he's sired by Seth is Abel's posterity does that make sense this is the Leverite law in the Old Testament and so we see see it Adam Seth uh, Enos Canaan uh, Mahalil uh, Jared Enoch Methuselah Lamech Noah Shem Arphax and Ru Eber Peleg the priesthood is traced back through Abel rather than Seth in D&C uh, 84, which we talked about, and the conspiracy, conspiracy that takes place. The lineage through Abel implies the Leverite law of marriage was in fact the custom of widow marrying your deceased husband, brother, sometimes a near heir. The word has nothing to do with the name Levi or biblical uh, Levites. It's Leverite, which has to mean uh, deal with the Old English. I'm trying to get through this quickly. Uh, the law of the Leverite, the Leverite law is talked about in Deuteronomy 25. We know it was in existence in in Genesis because we see it with the story of Judah and Tamar. Uh, if you remember, Tamar marries uh, uh, Ur, who's the oldest son of Judah, and Ur and doesn't have any kids, so she then marries Onan, which is the brother, and he knows that he, she's gonna get a double portion, so she makes sure she doesn't get pregnant. The Lord takes him out, and the next son is Selah, and so he's spo she's supposed to marry Selah, and Selah takes off when he knows he has to marry his old aunt. Um, <laughs> And so he takes off, and then she sets up the red light district uh, when Judah's on his way to the auction, and Judah stops in, and she asks some pawn because the price is too high uh, of, the, of the patriarchal robe, the, the ring, the signet ring of the patriarch, and the staff, the priest representing the priesthood. She asks for that for pawn, and then she becomes, um, you know, the word gets around that she's um, uh, in a motherly way and they have a family meeting and Judah invites her back and says, and thinks, thinking to get rid of her and says, okay, you've been doing some indiscretions there and by the way, who's the father? Which was the mistake you made? And she says, just a minute. She goes out to her Volkswagen and gets the, brings back in the robe and the staff and the signet ring and, and, uh, and, and Mrs. Judah immediately recognizes it and says, you have some splaining to do. And so... <laughs> But anyway, that's the story of uh, the Leverite law, but it's there for a reason. It's there so that we can understand it. So, so anyway, well, the burden of Cain is the earth would not yield forth its strength, and he would be a fugitive and a vagabond, his posterity would not have the right of the priest. Now, keeping in mind that Joseph Smith said the seed of Cain would not hold the priesthood until the seed of Abel had a chance to come to the earth and fulfill their responsibility, the patriarchal responsibility of the descendants of Abel. And that's, that's the descendants that we just talked about. And we go down to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Joseph, and Ephraim. And then in our dispensation, who does it go to? Now this is that lineage, the recollect lineage of Abel. How does it continue down through? Joseph Smith said that the seed of Cain would not be able to hold the priest until the seed of Abel had an opportunity to come to the earth and fulfill their responsibility. What is, what is that lineage in our, in our time period? Church patriarch. Okay, who are the church, who's the first church patriarch? Joseph Smith Sr. Okay. That's, that's, he, Brigham Young said the blood of Joseph that was sold in Egypt, the blood of Joseph runs pure in the veins of Joseph Smith and his father. Pure. Joseph Smith Sr. is a direct line. Joseph isn't the firstborn. Joseph Smith Jr. is not the firstborn. Joseph Smith Sr. is the patriarch to the church. He is that direct line of Abel. Okay. And who's next? Hiram Smith. Hiram Smith has a son. Joseph F. Smith. But he becomes the prophet. And then it goes to John Smith. And from John Smith, Eldridge G. Smith. He just died just a few years ago. Was he 106 or something like that, I think? 106? He just died a few years ago. So that's the lineage of Abel. Adam, Abel, Enos, Canaan, Mahalil, Jared, right on down to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Ephraim, Joseph Smith Sr., Hiram Smith, Joseph Smith, F. Smith, John Smith, Eldridge G. Smith. <laughs> Keeping in mind, Joseph Smith said that the seed of Cain would not hold the priesthood until the seed of Abel had an opportunity to come to the earth and fulfill their responsibility. 
The revelation about the priesthood was given in June of 18, in 1978 and was read to the church on September 30th, 1978 at the October conference. Within a few months of the announcements, another revelatory event happened to fulfill the prophetic, prophetic statement of Joseph Smith. What was it? President Tanner, under the direction of President Kimball, read the letter to the church because of the increased number, of the, uh, large increase of the number of stake patriarchs and the uh, availability of patriarchal service throughout the world. We now designate Elder Eldridge G. Smith as a uh, patriarch emeritus, which means that he is honorably, honorably relieved of all his duties and responsibilities pertaining to the office of the patriarch of the church. Keeping in mind Joseph Smith's statement that the seed of Cain would not hold the priesthood until the seed of Abel had an opportunity to come to the earth and fulfill their responsibility. The same time that the priesthood is given to all worthy males, the seed of Abel had fulfilled their responsibility and released. It wasn't because of pressure. It was because of, of revelation. The Lord knows the end from the beginning. He has prepared everything. And it was fulfilled just as Joseph Smith prophesied and stated. Even though many of the brethren had said, well, Abel never had any kids, therefore it'll never happen in this life. Unknowing of the Leverite law and that the priesthood line was traced back through Abel and the Doctrine and Covenants. The release of Elder G. Smith as the patriarch to the church took place at virtually the same time the priesthood was made available to all worthy males. President Kimball's inspiration and timing was not just incredible, but inspired as these events unfolded according to the prophecy of Joseph Smith that the seed of Cain would not hold the priesthood until the seed of Abel had a chance to fulfill their responsibility on earth. The revelation on the priesthood in 1978 happened in concert with the release of Patriarch Smith. It was, and was no accident, even if the connection was not fully understood. The seed of Cain could not hold the priesthood until the seed of Abel. So it doesn't matter whether the prophet, President Kimball, or anybody else knew that. It doesn't matter whether they knew it or understand this concept. It happened by revelation, and it happened at the right time, and it happened in the exact same way that Joseph Smith said it would happen. And it was inspired in the right time, keeping in mind, too, that the seed of Cain was restricted from administration, not participation. Okay? 1978, the priest is given to all worthy males and the descendant of Abel is released from their responsibilities. Okay, any questions? I finished with a minute to spare.